My name is Ron Spurgeon. I'm a communication specialist with the U.S. Postal Service, and today we're going to introduce the Ursula Le Guin stamp. This is the 33rd stamp in the Literary Arts series. The series began in 1979. It has a lot of notable uh, authors in this. So you'll see Walt Whitman, Mark Twain, and many others. So it's really an honor to have her included in this. Uh, she has eight Hugo Awards, Ursula does, and getting one is an amazing feat. She has eight plus many other accolades and is well known as a cross-genre author. So we're absolutely tickled pink to have her here today in this stamp series. This will be a three ounce stamp, equivalent to uh, any three ounces you want to send anywhere in the United States in its territories. So I hope you enjoy the stamp. It's a beautiful one. She was such an amazing person. I, as I say, an inspiration. I always remember she said, you have to have a door you can close. And she would close her door for her writing in the morning, like 9 o'clock, and then emerge later on. The U.S. Postal Service honors the cross-genre writings of Ursula K. Le Guin, the acclaimed science fiction and fantasy writer with the 33rd stamp in its literary series. Her literary career spanned over a 60-year period where she produced over 20 novels, over 100 short stories, as well as poetry and children's books. Her novel, The Left Hand of Darkness, published in 1969, explored gender identification. Her novel won the Hugo and Nebula Awards for Best Science Fiction and Fantasy Novels. She also raised the standards for science fiction writing. Ursula K. Le Guin. With Ursula Le Guin's son. Just tell me a little bit about your mother and do you have a favorite book or, or novel or poetry that she wrote? Well, I get asked that question a lot and there are many, many books to choose from. I would say Left Hand of Darkness in recent years has been the book that I've read and referenced the most, so it's very appropriate that the Postal Service honored her so nicely with that book in the background. And tell me what you think of this stamp. I think it's beautiful. As soon as I saw the design for it, I knew the photograph on which it was based. There are two photo shoots uh, that she did in the 2000s that are my favorite. This is one of them. The other was shortly before she died, and they both show very different qualities of her character. The photo on which the stamp is based is her inquiring, slightly challenging her uh, self, slightly challenging self, which is a a version of her that we all knew, <laughs> those of us who knew her well, and it's absolutely part of her character and it's kind of amazing to have that intense gaze coming come in at me from the stamp. And just to end, when, when you were growing up, did she stress a lot uh, writing and, and reading and, and literature? She did, but not in a heavy-handed way. She read to us, all, all of uh, the kids, my two sisters and myself, a lot. And I do think that is the best way to instill a lifelong love of reading, is to read to your kids. It's a very natural transition from being read to to reading yourself as your own curiosity develops and maybe you want to read something different from what your mother wants to read to you. Needless to say, she was also a fantastic reader, so that helped. I didn't know that at the time, but you know, in retrospect, I look back at her public performances and she was a very, very good reader. Tom, who's sitting right in front of me, taught with Charles at PSU. And Charles and was her husband? Charles is her husband, who is still alive and will be here shortly. And then we began to travel together, the four of us, and essentially went all over the world on cruise ships which of course are now extinct practically. But it was, we went to the South Seas, we went to Alaska. Um, we had a wonderful time together. I don't know quite how we saw eye to eye, but we did, it was lovely. With us is Ursula Le, Le Guin's um, husband, Charles. Charles, just tell us what you think about this stamp and tell us a little bit about Ursula. Well, I can't tell you anything about the stamp but, uh, uh, other than it, there it is. Uh, but I can tell you a good deal about her if I had time because we were married a long time. And she was a wonderful companion. Oh, you're great.
We love this stamp. That's that's wonderful that it's going to be covering all over the, the, the world. Well, I love the woman. The stamp is nice. Yeah. But so is she. <laughs> what a great day to be celebrating one of Oregon's finest, Ursula K. Le Guin. I thank you all for joining us today, and I want to extend a heartfelt welcome to Charles. Charles, we greatly appreciate you being here, and welcome to Portland Art Museum. Our first speaker this morning is our dedicating official. Joe Corbett is the Chief Financial Officer and the Executive Vice President at the United States Post Office. As you can imagine, it's been an undertaking. The Postal Service provides a critical service to our country, as we all know. This was especially true this past year, when it served as a lifeline to millions of Americans during this pandemic. The essential workers of the Postal Service delivered checks and medicines and supplies to keep us going during a very difficult period. And they continue to do an incredible job every day. Everyone. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Joe Corbett. Le Guin once said she wanted to see science fiction step over the old walls of convention and hit right into the next wall and start to break it down too. She felt the ideas represented in her fiction could help people become more aware and see there are other ways to do things and other ways to be. Le Guin received many awards for her brilliant storytelling, including multiple Hugo and Nebula Awards, the top prizes for science fiction and fantasy writing. Le Guin's record of accomplishment was the result of her remarkable intellect and imagination, her resilience and tenacity, which is what creativity and artistic expression are all about. In a similar fashion, U.S. postage stamps are a form of artistic expression that celebrate the people, places, and things that represent the best of our nation. Beginning today, Ursula Le Guin officially joins the other honorees featured on a literary art stamp, such as John Steinbeck, Zora Neale, Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, Dorothy Parker, Mark Twain, Tennessee Williams, and James Baldwin, just to name a few. The stamp features a portrait of Le Guin based on a 2006 photograph, and the background shows a scene from her acclaimed sci-fi classic, The Left Hand of Darkness, the one I read on the way out. Her name appears along the bottom of the stamp, and the words USA and three ounce are printed vertically down the left side. Our next speaker is Linda Long from the University of Oregon Libraries, where she is the curator of manuscripts. Her research specialties include historical and literary manuscripts, gender, sexuality, and race, and research methodologies and instruction. Please say hello to Linda Long. I had the privilege of being Ursula Le Guin's archivist and curator of her manuscript collection at the University of Oregon Libraries. We both knew that developing and preserving her collection would be vital for future research. Thus, we had a symbiotic relationship, and for over 20 years, I worked with her to build the collection. Together, we were able to build one of the most important literary manuscript collections in the country. Back to the Ursula Le Guin papers, one of the most valuable and heavily researched collections we have in the UO libraries. You can visualize the manuscripts and letters and other materials now nicely organized in acid-free archival boxes and neatly arranged on shelf after shelf after shelf, occupying over 140 linear feet. That's about 269 archival boxes. The collection includes quite a variety of materials from Ursula's long life as a writer. Drafts of literary manuscripts, poetry, letters received and carbon copies of her letters sent, audio and video recordings, speeches, photographs, contracts, and her preserved website, all for the researcher to use. You might think that the drafts of the literary manuscripts are in heavy demand, 
and you would be right, they are. The changes she made in word choice or sentence structure offer a window into Ursula's writing style and themes. But the part of the collection that receives the heaviest use by far is the letters. Letters received from other writers, literary agents, and fans, and the carbon copies of her outgoing letters. Together, letters sent and received are a rich reflection of a person's life and a writer's life. By reading her letters, researchers can learn about both her struggles to write and her successes, and they reveal much about her personality. The letters show her wit, her wisdom, her annoyances, and her joys. We can be grateful that she wrote on paper, by hand, or on a typewriter. Sure, she did use email later in life, and we do have that email preserved in her collection. But it's the actual letters on paper that speak to us. This is partly because the writer touched the pages, signed them, folded them, addressed the envelopes, licked the envelopes, and affixed the stamps. The letters to and from Ursula, therefore, have much more than just informational or evidential value. They have intrinsic material artifactual value. Not only do letters represent a writer, but their content provides us in insights into a particular time and place. Ursula just didn't write about writing. She commented on current events, justice and injustice, and the ethics and issues of our times. The intimacy of the letters and her often unguarded and refreshing comments help us understand her temperament, her fears and frustrations, as well as her happiness. In one of her early letters to her agent, Virginia Kidd, Ursula revealed that she thought she needed an agent at that stage of her career in 1968. This was just after Earthsea was published, especially because she was just finishing up with a new book. She says in her letter, quote, the book, The Left Hand of Darkness, ought to be out of the torture chamber in a week or two. And if you want, I'll send it to you first, and with it, various old contracts for you to look over, as you suggested. And as many of us know, uh, Virginia Kidd became her agent for many, many, many years. Did you know that Ursula was also a visual artist? In her letters, she would often draw humorous doodles that reflect her creativity and mischievousness. Her little drawings at a depth and dimension that can't be captured in email or by emojis. Over a hundred of Ursula's original letters are available in our James Tiptree Jr. papers. Most of Ursula's letters to Tiptree include her pen and ink drawings, which are often of imaginary animals, demonstrating Ursula's full range of creativity and humor. Email, for all its benefits of speed and use, can't compare with the physicality of actual paper correspondence. I'll end my comments by saying that we archivists and librarians are fundamentally all about access to information. We collect and process primary sources and catalog books to help people get to the information they need. The US Postal Service has a similar purpose. It's about helping people access information and share information. Ursula's epistolary life certainly kept the post office busy. How perfect that Ursula Le Guin now has her own postage stamp. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. In 1966, a New York publisher took a chance and released a book by an unknown woman living clear across the country. Mrs. Le Guin, as the editors of Ace Books called her, had previously sold stories to magazines. Now she had produced her first novel, Rokanon's World, which the editors pitched as an interplanetary fantasy. Their admiration for the book might seem, they acknowledged, to be extravagant praise for a beginner. But, they assured their readers, she has talent. Indeed, she did. Le Guin won numerous top literary honors, including, as mentioned earlier, the title of Grand Master from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, a recognition of her work elevating the genres from dime store paperbacks to literature worthy of academic symposia. She, pardon me, 
she established a legacy that ranged from amplifying and inspiring women's voices to promoting libraries and literary organizations. In addition to all her literary achievements, Ursula Le Guin excelled at writing letters to the editor. Her letters were textbook examples of the genre. She chose a specific, well-defined topic. She understood that a letter to the editor is at heart a public dialogue, and she set her tone accordingly. And she always took up an unmistakable stance. Take the opening line of a 1966 note that she wrote to an Oregonian columnist who published it as, essentially, a letter to the editor. I understand, via a special committee of the Science Fiction Writers of America, that Star Trek is in danger of being canceled or made into baby food. <laughs> Le Guin went on to praise the show and to urge other fans to write to the network. That was back when she was making her literary debut with the publication of her first science fiction work. In later letters to the editor, she broadened her purview, writing on such varied topics as the public art of Oregon artist Tom Hardy, the killing of Portland-raised engineer Ben Linder in Nicaragua, and the University of Oregon's effort to acquire Oregon author Ken Kesey's papers. She advocated for a ballot measure to set up a library tax district, pushed back on columnist George Will's take on democracy, and scoffed at so-called alternative facts. Her letters to the editor shared a common thread, a fervent concern for democratic processes and the public good. She wrote that she joined the call for a library tax district because she saw the library as a public service and a public trust, a storehouse of information and knowledge that served the community and therefore was rightfully supported by the community. Given Le Guin's penchant for participating in the public discourse through letters to the editor, it is altogether fitting that we should be here today celebrating a stamp issued in her honor. I like to think that someday soon, a Le Guin stamp will appear on an envelope containing a crisply written and memorable letter to the editor. Thank you. Ursula Le Guin was a woman of letters in every sense of the phrase via the Postal Service and email. For nearly six decades, we exchanged words on the page and on the screen, sometimes at great length, often briefly. We made lunch dates, and we broke them. We wrote about our families, our work, current events, and our cats. The catless manuscript is not worth writing she once said on a postcard, the words outlined in feline form. I had complained that my cat had sat on a page of manuscript I was trying to edit by hand. And we wrote about who and what we were reading. Toni Morrison, Mary Shelley, James Baldwin, Isadora Duncan, Louisa May Alcott, Vonda McIntyre, Molly Gloss, Carolyn Kaiser, Sylvia Plath, poetry and prose, fiction and nonfiction, and yeah, other people's mail, as in the letters of Virginia Woolf and William Butler Yeats. One day, probably in 1969, we had arranged to meet on the steps of the downtown library before walking over to the Diamond Head Cafe for lunch, which has gone the way of Meriwether's. Ursula didn't drive a car, and I had pledged to take her home after our cheeseburgers, root beer floats, and straw paper shooting contest. <laughs> yes, we did that, we literary ladies. She taught me how and she always won. That day, Ursula emerged from the library door carrying a huge stack of books. I glanced at the titles as I relieved her of part of the burden. All of them were about the psychology of sleep, of dreams, of unconscious and semi-conscious behavior, 
she was doing the research for The Lathe of Heaven, published 50 years ago. Lathe, of course, is about a lot more than that. The greenhouse effect is mentioned on page six in connection with the view of Mount Hood from Portland. Go online and you will see it reviewed as an early predictor of climate change, but not as a novel about the abuse of power, a theme that runs through, I'd venture to say, the bulk of Ursula's fiction, certainly The Left Hand of Darkness, published two years earlier. Nor do I very often see humor mentioned. Odd, since when I recently reread Lathe, I found myself laughing out loud and frightening my cat. <laughs> Ursula was a seer with a sense of humor, and how. We learn in school, some of us anyway, that the devil is in the details. In Ursula's work, in just about all of it, from poems, to essays, to novels, to children's books, to letters, to friends, the humor is in them too. And in conversation, I once told Ursula that she was a role model for me. Oh, she said, looking at me like that, <laughs> giving me that sly, sidewise look. What kind of role? Parker House? <laughs> love, love, love those stories. Our final speaker today is a very special guest. She's representing the Le Guin family. I'm pleased to present Ursula's granddaughter, India Downs Le Guin. India lives on the Oregon coast and curates workshops and residencies for writers in Portland. I'm delighted to present India Downs Le Guin. I admire so many things about Ursula as an artist, an activist, thinker, and for me as a grandmother. I'm grateful for this rare opportunity to share a little bit about our relationship on such a momentous occasion. The stamp is a particularly significant symbol to me because it was through writing each other letters that Ursula and I really got to know one another. Growing up in Portland, I spent lots of time with Ursula and my grandfather Charles. As children, my sister and I had solo dates with our grandparents, pickling garlicky cucumbers or frosting Christmas cookies. We always look forward to these visits. Alone time got harder to fit in as we grew older and busier, and for a while our relationship simmered on the back burner. This changed when I left for college out of state. Suddenly farther away from my support systems than ever before, I began writing to my friends and family members as a way to combat my homesickness. Everyone I wrote to appreciated the gesture, but most of them didn't reply. <laughs> Ursula always replied. Over the years, we ended up exchanging so many letters. We wrote about what books we were reading, the classes I was taking, trips we had coming up, really anything that was happening in our lives. Ursula had gorgeous handwriting and immaculate taste in stationery, and among her sprawling script, there were usually inky paw prints, notations from her beloved cat, Pard. Ursula also had a wicked sense of humor and was an accomplished visual artist, so there were always little drawings or funny comics included. On many of the letters, she drew a flush of pink roses, which she could see from outside her window at their house on the Oregon coast, where she often wrote to me. I recently reread these letters. I think I was looking for a nugget of wisdom or a particularly poignant quote that I could share with you all and center the speech around. But of course, these letters were casual and loving, not some didactic practice on either end. And this actually makes them all the more precious to me. This wasn't Ursula K. Le Guin, a famous author, brilliant thinker that I was corresponding with. This was Amma, my grandmother. In fact, these relaxed exchanges were confirmation that I was growing up and that we had developed a balanced relationship as individuals. Up until this point, when I saw Ursula, we were almost always around family or some larger group of people. Our epistolary relationship had allowed us to step outside of that dynamic and get to know each other on a more intimate and personal level. Even though most of this correspondence occurred during the years we were living in different states, I, be I became closer with my grandmother than ever before. Ursula and I stopped writing letters when I graduated, but only because I moved back to Portland and into her house with Charles. As I stumbled my way through post-grad life and into a job in publishing, Ursula was there for me as a mentor. I consider those years living together some of the sweetest and most formative of my life. I don't think I'm reaching when I say we were able to settle in so seamlessly because we've been writing letters and getting to know each other all along. 
After Ursula died, I found myself spending a lot of time with the things she had given me. She left behind what still feels like a huge hole in my life, and I needed tangible objects to anchor me, physical proof that she had been here and I could still keep her close. There was the jade necklace I wore around my neck, fingering the smooth beads whenever I wanted some extra strength. The shimmering stone prism we picked out together at a crystal store near her house we used to sneakily stop by in between errands. The book she gifted me over the years, usually poetry, always with the most elegant inscriptions. And most importantly, the letters. The letters are things I can still hold that Ursula made for me and me alone. She touched these pages, licked these stamps, thought of me the whole time she was writing them. These letters have kept us in touch long after the day that I first plucked them from my mailbox. I write this now from Ursula's office at her cabin on the Oregon coast, across from the flush of pink flowers she drew for me in her letters so many times. I moved here some weeks ago, and once again, I inhabit a space of Ursula's, though this time she's not here with me. So many of the letters she sent came from this town's tiny post office, and now they are back here with me again, coming full circle. It's hard to know how to end this. It's hard that Ursula isn't here anymore. It will always be hard, but honors like the stamp remind me that it can be joyous too. I'm so thankful for the time we shared together, so privileged to visit the spaces she lived and the vast archive of work she left behind. So lucky to have a stack of letters she wrote for me next to me. It was through Ursula that I learned the importance of writing letters, which is really a way of showing me the importance of connecting with the people you love. It feels perfect that she will continue to be a part of this process for so many others too. Thank you. I'm just inspired to see such a beautiful piece of art and um, like remember like this image that I've had of her like only from my students like I've seen her bef only one time before like on the back of a book that my students would read about and I think it's beautiful to hear all the stories of somebody that you know that just really touched the world in a special way. I, I was here um, to admire the work of Le Guin, Ursula Le Guin and um, I think she was a, a fantastic literary scholar. And I'm Crystal Hart reporting from Portland, Oregon on the Ursula K. Le Guin stamp. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Go out, buy a stamp, and mail a letter today.